Chapter 9, Violence and Abuse. Upon completion of the chapter, you will be able to examine the incidents of violence in women, characterize the cycle of violence and appropriate interventions, evaluate the various myths and facts about violence, analyze the dynamics of sexual abuse, select the resources available to women experiencing abuse, and outline the role of the nurse who cares for abused women. Intimate partner violence is actual or threatened physical or sexual violence or psychological emotional abuse. Research suggests that physical violence in intimate relationships is often accompanied by psychological abuse and in one third to over one half of cases by sexual abuse. Because a nurse may be the first health care provider to assess and identify the signs of intimate partner violence, a nurse can have a profound impact on a woman's decision to seek help. So it's very important that as nurses we are able to identify abuse and help the victim who is being abused. Other descriptive terms for intimate partner violence include domestic abuse, domestic violence, gender-based violence, spouse abuse, battering, and rape. Characteristics of intimate partner violence. Although more research is needed in this area, studies have found certain risk factors for intimate partner violence in men. These risk factors can be divided into four different categories, individual factors, relationship factors, community factors, and societal factors. We know that most um, individuals that are abusers usually uh, use and abuse substances, whether alcohol or illegal drugs. It definitely has a negative effect, especially if there's children involved. Usually um, those that abuse have a history of childhood abuse. On page 283 of your, your book, the evidence-based practice 9.2, it talks about sibling sexual abuse and exploratory study of long-term consequences for self-esteem and counseling considerations. Characteristics, characteristics of the perpetrator's partner. Uh, many women that are abused were abused as children and may have poor self-esteem, poor health. PTSD, depression, insomnia, low education achievement, or history of suicide attempts, injury, or drug and alcohol abuse, which makes them easy targets to uh, intimate partner violence. Usually the abusers, they can come from all walks of life and often feel insecure, powerless, and helpless, feelings that are not in line with the macho image they would like to project. The abuser expresses his feelings of inadequacy through violence or aggression towards others. Women are at a higher risk for violence during pregnancy. Recent research findings indicate that having children does not protect women from intimate partner violence. On the contrary, the intimate partner violence appears to last longer if women have children, and this also seems to be the case even after the partnership has come to an end. Pregnant women are vulnerable during this time and abusers can take advantage of it. Abuse during pregnancy threatens the well-being of the mother and the fetus. Physical violence may involve injuries to the head, face, neck, thorax, breast, and abdomen. It's really important for nurses to be aware of signs and symptoms of abuse or intimate partner violence and when you have a female patient especially if she's pregnant comes in as the nurse we are required to report any signs of physical mental uh, abuse this chart lists the risk factors for intimate partner violence in men the four different types of factors individual factors include young age heavy drinking personality disorders, depression, low academic achievement, witnessing violence as a child, low income, or actually experiencing violence as a child. 
Relationship factors include marital conflict, economic stress, dysfunctional family, marital instability, male dominance in family, cohabitation, having outside sexual partners. Community factors in include weak sanctions against intimate partner violence, poverty, and low social capital. Your societal factors include the traditional gender norms and social norms supportive of violence. Question, is the following statement true or false? The tendency for violence is inherited, true or false? The answer is false. We know that violence is a learned behavior that without intervention is self-perpetuating. Next, we're going to move on to the cycle of violence. In an abusive relationship, the cycle of violence comprises three distinct phases, the tension building phase, the acute battering phase, and the honeymoon phase. The cyclical behavior begins with a time of tension building arguments, progresses to violence, and settles into a makeup or calm period. This cycle of violence increases in frequency and severity as it is repeated over and over again. In your textbook on page 272, there's box 9.1 that goes over the cycle of violence. As you can see, phase one is the tension building. There's verbal or minor, minor battery occurs. Almost any subject such as housekeeping or money may trigger the buildup of tension. There is a breakdown of communication. The victim attempts to calm the abuser. The victim feels like walking on eggshells around the abuser. Phase two is the acute battering is characterized by uncontrollable discharge of tension. Violence is rarely triggered by the victim's behavior. She is battered no matter what her response. The start of the battering episode is unpredictable and beyond the victim's control. Phase three, reconciliation or the honeymoon phase, is the calm phase. First, the abuser is ashamed of his behavior. The batterer tries to minimize the abuse and blame it on the partner. The batterer becomes loving, kind, and apologetic and expresses guilt. Then the abuser works on making the victim feel responsible. This loving behavior strengthens the bond between partners and will probably convince the victim, once again, that leaving the relationship is not necessary. So those are the three phases of the cycle of violence. Types of abuse. Abusers may use whatever it takes to control a situation, from emotional abuse and humiliation to physical assault. Victims often tolerate emotional, physical, financial, and sexual abuse. Many remain in abusive relationships because they believe they deserve the abuse. And on page 272 and 273, you can read about the different types of abuse. The slides talk about the profiles of those who are victimized and those who are the abuser. The victims rarely describe themselves as abused, battered women syndrome, may feel they have a personality flaw or inadequacy. Uh, many are abused as children and many believe that is something they did that causes the abuse. The abuser usually has feelings of insecurity, powerlessness, and helplessness and there's a refusal to share power, so they use violence to control the victim. Question, is the following statement true or false? Most women experiencing intimate partner violence do not describe themselves as being abused. True or false? The answer is true. Victims of abuse rarely describe themselves as abused. Violence against pregnant women. Pregnancy typically is a time of escalating violence in already troubled relationships. You add a pregnancy on top of an already abusive relationship and it's going to add more tension to the relationship. Uh, factors leading to battering during pregnancy. 
Uh, some of the factors can include the inability of the couple to cope with the stresses of pregnancy, young age at the time of pregnancy, having less than a high school education for both partners, unemployment, violence in the family, cohabitation and single marital status, heavy drinking by the partner. All of these are different factors that lead to battering during pregnancy. We know that violence is threatening to the mom and also the baby, especially if the abuser wants to kick or punch the mom in the abdomen region where my baby is growing. Uh, and signs of abuse usually emerges during pregnancy, especially since the woman has to go to the doctor uh, more often. So it's very important that as maternal health nurses, we know the cues and the signs and symptoms of abuse. Uh, some of the types of sexual violence that we're going to discuss a little bit about. We talked about inti intimate partner violence. Human trafficking really is now becoming a problem all across the United States and other countries. I know now in Florida, to renew your license every two years, you have to take a course on human trafficking. Incest, female genital cutting, we don't see that too much over here in our country, but in other countries, uh, female genital cutting is practiced. I know when I was working as an OB nurse, we had an influx of refugees come from Africa and all of the women had had the infibulation or the female genital cutting. So we had to take classes on how to deal with them while they were in labor. And all of the women that we delivered from this, uh, from Africa, after they delivered, they wanted to be sewn back up because if they hadn't been sewn back up, they would be shunned from, from the family. Uh, prostitution and bondage, we see that very r rampantly in Florida. Exploitation and neglect, infant side, and sexual assault. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we'll hit a few of them that are important. So the female genital mutilation is also called, called female circumcision. It reflects the ideology and cultural values of the community that practices it. Uh, the different types, there's a box 9.5 on page 290, and you can read through the different types of female uh, genital mutilation. There are certain health risks when it comes to Complications can include infertility, dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, sexual dysfunction, infection, hemorrhage after the procedure, vaginal stenosis, chronic vaginitis, pelvic inflammatory disease. So it, it really can be quite impactful on the woman's sexual response on when she has children, UTI. So there's just so, so many things that the woman who has the female genital cutting is at risk for. Not, not only the, the physical, but also the psychological effects that can occur. Uh, nursing management includes self-awareness of feelings related to the practice. So you have to know how you feel about it. And then take into consideration the female in her culture and how she feels. Uh, it definitely has an impact on the women's, on the woman's reproductive health. And then a lot of education. Like I said, we had to take several classes to uh, be educated on female genital mutilation. Human trafficking is a global and domestic problem. The victims are primarily women and children lacking education, employment, and economic opportunities in their own country. Uh, the women and sometimes men, the exposure of victims to serious and numerous health risks. So the implications for nursing is to recognize cues 
the cues of human trafficking. In box 9.6 and on page 291, it goes over the identifying victims of human trafficking. So make sure you're familiar with that. Human trafficking is a violation of human rights, notification of law enforcement and regional social service organizations. So you have to report it if you, you think someone is being trafficked. The nursing management of abuse victims assessment, routine screening for indicators of abuse, screening during every health care visit, see box 9.2 and evidence-based practice 9.1, immediate isolation from family if abuse is detected, direct and indirect questions about abuse, immediate safety assessment, documentation, and reporting of the findings. As a nurse, every patient you see, and this is the Joint Commission standard, is you have to assess for abuse, whether you ask if you're comfortable in your home? Are you scared in your home? Are you safe in your home? Every hospital, every inpatient record, whenever you do an inpatient database when you're admitting a patient, there's always a question about abuse. This is box 9.3 in your textbook. It talks about the SAVE model Basically, you screen all of your clients for violence by act, asking them certain questions. Do you feel in control of your life? Within the last year, have you been physically hurt by someone? You want to ask direct questions in a non-judgmental way. Validate the client by telling them you believe their story. You do not blame them. And then evaluate, educate, and refer the client by asking them the type of violence. Does she feel like she's in danger now? Does she have a safe place to go to for the night? Uh, nursing management of abuse victims continue. Uh, interventions, the goal is to enable the victim to, con to gain control of their life. Uh, primary prevention includes breaking the abuse cycle through community initiatives. Secondary prevention, dealing with victims and abusers in early stages to prevent progression of abuse. And your tertiary prevention is helping severely abused women and children recover and become productive members of society and rehabilitating abusers to stop the cycle of violence. Nursing interventions continue. You want to educate the woman about community services, different programs she can uh, use provide emotional support, and offer a safety plan. And if you look on page 282, the teaching guidelines 9.1, where the nice pretty apple is, it uh, talks about the safety plan for leaving an abusive relationship. Question. Which of the following would best describe the primary focus of nursing interventions for a woman who is a victim of intimate partner violence? A, providing reassurance. B, educating the woman about resources available. C, documenting assessment findings. D, assisting the woman to gain control of her life. The answer is D, assisting the woman to gain control of her life. Although all the interventions listed are important, the primary goal of nursing interventions is to enable the victim to gain control of her life by providing sensitive, predictable care in an accepting setting. Uh, this slide is box 9.4 on page 281 in your textbook, and it's the ABCDEs of caring for abused women. So A is reassuring the woman that she is not alone. B is expressing the belief that violence against women is not acceptable in any situation and that it is not her fault. C is confidentiality since the woman might believe that if the abuse is reported, the abuser will retaliate. D is documentation which includes the following. You want to use a clear quoted statement about the abuse, accurate description, and photos of the injuries. 
E is education about the cycle of violence and that it will escalate. And S is safety. The most important aspect of the intervention is to ensure that the woman has resources and a plan of action to carry out when she decides to leave. This concludes the lecture, the audio lecture for Chapter 9, Violence and Abuse. Thank you.